<laughs> Hello everyone, I've just worked out the mute button on this microphone, so I'm very sorry about the delay in this presentation. Um, I'm going to invite everybody up one at a time, just because there's somebody that we're doing no photos for, so just so you know, this is not the case for Amy though. Please feel free to take photos, tag her on Twitter, use our <laughs> hashtag, it's right here. Um, and actually, I'm really happy to be introducing Amy Neal here because I got the pleasure of meeting her the other day at a different conference. Um, and she is recently graduate from Public Histories, MA, at Birkbeck University. And today, she is doing When Fact Meets Fiction. Can period dramas like Call the Midwife radically reshape how people engage with and understand the past? So, could we have a big round of applause for Amy? Thank you. Um, so, period drama is difficult to define. It is always changing, reinterpreting, and reformulating itself in relation to the present. An innovative form of storytelling, I would argue it's not so different from the work of historians. Um, the innate storytelling ability of television makes period drama one of the most compelling and accessible ways to re-examine the past and the present. Um, so, based on my MA thesis, I'm going to use the period drama Call the Midwife, as you can see to challenge the traditional assumptions of British period drama by discussing how it fictionalises historical facts to centre stories about race, gender and disability and how this can radically reshape public understanding of the past. So traditionally in Britain, the period drama is often viewed as conservative, the purveyor of nostalgia and closely associated with comfy Sunday nights escaping modern life. Primarily based on adaptations, it has tended to lean towards a cultural conservatism and has been responsible for propagating erroneous myths and popularising certain expectations. I would argue that period drama is probably the most British of television dramas and it is certainly the most exported, playing a key role in the representation of the British national story and identity. Um, this relationship is subtle and complex and reveals the hidden ideological function of British period drama. These dramas are incredibly influential in shaping a sense of British identity throughout the world and can be considered more a site of contention and mediation than just a genre alone. National identity is the prism through which all other themes are explored in British period dramas and through this lens, recent period dramas, such as Call the Midwife, are articulating different and more nuanced versions of Britishness, interrogating the conservative impetus of the genre and using it as a site of engagement to investigate and depict stories that challenge presumptions about the national past. So, Call the Midwife. The cosy Sunday night guilty pleasure is actually one of television's most radical period dramas, hiding in plain sight. Often dismissed and misunderstood as uncomplicated nostalgia, this popular long-running series serves as a compelling example of effective history making and demonstrates how people can engage with and understand the past in the present. Screened in over 235 territories worldwide, it has become something of a phenomenon and invites serious analysis and reflection on its historical and cultural significance. Broadcast on Sunday evenings at 8pm on BBC One, this highly successful drama is currently in its 11th season and it follows a group of nuns and midwives who live and work together in post-war London's East End. Centred on a convent hospital, the Nottingham House, it tells the story of Jenny Lee, a young, newly qualified midwife, starting, and it starts in 1958, and the most recent series has just come up to 1967. Um, based on the personal and personal history and memoirs of Jennifer Worth, Jenny Lee, who's pictured here, um, it was adapted for television by screenwriter Heidi Thomas, with the first few series relying heavily on Worth's memoirs. Once the memoirs were exhausted and Jenny departed from the Nottingham House, Thomas widened the lens of the drama and began to scour the archives of social history, from the hands of the official report of all parliamentary debates to the health board minutes for the District of Poplar. Like a historian, Thomas began researching her storylines to ensure that they were rooted in historical fact and started using these certainties as tent poles onto which she built her stories, and fictionalising the facts to personalise the history. This widening of the lens allowed her to kick against the genre and make space for marginalised stories to be told, 
actively rewriting them back into the narrative of British history, and importantly, placing those forgotten stories before a mainstream audience, confounding traditional expectations and challenging US perceptions of the past. Call the Midwife attempts a complex negotiated meanings for a British period drama. On one hand, it fulfills its ideological role by using the prism of national identity and history to make sense of and interrogate the shared past. Um, on the other, it offers a competing and different narrative of British national path compared to what you would consider a British, a traditional British drama, which I'm going to use Downton Abbey, sorry. <laughs> While Downton can be considered social history, it prevents it presents and promotes the conservative story, centering on a rich white aristocratic family and focusing on the big events of a big well-known events from Britain's past, such as the sinking of the Titanic and the Great Wall. Um, while C, like Call It Midwife, offers the alternative and parallel story, focusing on the social history of this period. By focusing on this social history, it makes space for the stories of those communities that have been historically marginalised and articulates the emotions associated by representing these stories with sensitivity and love. That's not to say that Colin Midwife ignores the big events of history, rather it juxtaposes them with the marginalised stories, highlighting that they are equally significant, if not more so, and encouraging viewers to question their perception of the national past and maybe interrogate what it means to be British. Colin Midwife does this with determination with every episode across its multiple series, exploring the marginalised histories of race, gender and disability. These themes are threaded throughout Call the Midwife and often overlap, but due to time constraints, I've artificially separated them. Um, so Call the Midwife, I would argue, explicitly addresses the issue of race and racism, whilst other period dramas, I would argue, actively avoid it. Using the lens of migration and the movement of people, it depicts a diverse range of characters and stories that explore race in London East End, with storylines centering families who have migrated from across the Commonwealth and even to tackle stories about the gypsy traveller community. In series seven, the character of Lucille Anderson um, is introduced, a young black midwife who has emigrated from Jamaica to support the rapidly expanding National Health Service in the 1960s. Based on the many Caribbean nurses who answered the NHS's call and emigrated, she's probably the first black midwife to be depicted in British in period drama on television. Played by Leonie Elliott, a black British actor whose family emigrated from Jamaica in the 1960s, her introduction as a main character represents an important first. Colin Midwife actively confronts the racism during this period of British history with the depiction of the harsh realities of being a young black woman with agency in a predominantly white society. The audience response to Lucille's introduction was extremely positive, with viewers commenting on Twitter that this was an important step for representation. Amanda Ray Prescott, an American, an American freelance entertainment journalist who specialises in tracking UK television primarily through the lens of racial diversity, commented that Lucille's introduction demonstrated that Call the Midwife was going to go there and confront racism in a way other period dramas had not. Call the Midwife subvert, subverts the traditional expectations of the British period drama with storylines that highlight how migration contributes to the nation. The fact that Call the Midwife is moving forward in time and is not fixed in aspect like other period dramas means it has a flexibility, allowing it to be more responsive to what is happening now and adapt accordingly to tell those stories authentically and with a real world impact. Radicalism is at the core of Call the Midwife simply by the fact that it centres women's lives in all and any forms, bucking the trend of doing women's history primarily through the lens of aristocracy and royalty. Women are depicted realistically, which is quite rare in drama as a whole, so it's quite significant. Um, female solidarity, resistance and agency are championed, and the act of childbirth celebrated. Scenes of labour and birth punctuate each episode like sex and violence do in other television dramas. All the stories centre women who play active roles in the world they inhabit. They are not defined solely by their relationship to men, Whilst the act of birth and motherhood is centred, Call the Midwife also focuses on the woman's work and vocations, as demonstrated by the midwives and nuns, challenging the assumptions that the ultimate purpose of a woman is to be a wife and mother. Written by women, 
for women, and sometimes even directed by women, means it can engage with contemporary topics such as rep reproductive freedom and allow viewers to interact with these histories on an emotional level. Call the Midwife charts the history of reproductive freedom in the UK, and although it implicitly endorses the benefits of birth control and family planning, it offers many different viewpoints of this story without judgment or censure. For its many series, it has tracked the lack of development and use of contraception and its impact on the women of Poplar. In the first few series, the consequences of women's lack of access to contraception is explored. Contraception is presented explicitly as part of the history of the liberation of women and their sexual lives, but not without its own consequences. By series four, the contraceptive pill has been introduced in the UK and is viewed as a magic portion at first by the midwives. However, it soon becomes apparent that there are significant limitations on its use. Most single women are unable to access reliable, affordable contraception. Colin Midwife does not shy away from the issue of abortion, the subject of abortion, and uses its format of serialization to blend historical research with emotional resonance and explore how politics can directly impact on women's lives. Series 8 tells the story of abortion from a radical point of view, that of the woman abortionist, and in doing so challenges the historical perceptions of this figure by reframing their criminal behaviour as a response to underlying social problems rather than criminality, suggesting social justice through state welfare provision as a solution rather than criminalisation. The history and impact of restricting and denying reproductive freedom to women is personalised, encouraging the viewer to be an active participant in the drama and to critique the narrative in relation to contemporary issues. This historicising of sex and the fact that Colin Midwife caters primarily for a female audience is depressingly the main reason for the series being written off by reviewers, normally male, who dismiss it out of hand as dealing with women's issues and therefore incapable of being serious or critical. However, with its exploration of reproductive freedoms, it's actually very topical and has a direct link to the now, where debates about abortion and reproductive freedom are still at the heart of most political discourses. We may all like to watch period drama, but we don't actually want to live in one. Call the midwife reminds people how central women's reproductive freedom or lack of it is to contemporary society. <laughs> um, an important thread that runs throughout Call the Midwife is the history of disability. This often invisible and underrepresented history plays a significant role in the stories told. The histories and experiences of disabled people are frequently absent from public spaces where people can engage with the past, such as museums. By depicting disabled characters and stories on a very popular mainstream television drama, Call the Midwife is actively restoring disabled people to the historical narrative and public consciousness, challenging people's perception of disability in the past and the present. Call of Midwife charts and personalises the history of Down syndrome, showing how the attitudes and treatment of people with Down syndrome changed in Britain during the 1950s and 60s. It reminds viewers of how far we've come as a society. In series 10, the taboos and stigmas associated with the birth of a child with Down syndrome in the 1960s is explored. The reaction, to the, birth, the reaction to this episode on social media was significant, um, and with people taking to Twitter to praise this episode on social media, with um, to praise this episode for the way it's a sensitive portrayal of the topic. Another hidden part of disability history that is explored and exposed is the con consequences of thalidomide, a drug that was marketed as a sedative and treatment for morning sickness in the late 1950s and 60s, and caused babies to be born with a range of disabilities, including missing and malformed limbs. In series five, the history of thalidomide is personalised through the story of Susan Mullix, a baby who is born with severely deformed arms and legs. As the legacy of thalidomide is still unfolding now, there was enormous commitment to accuracy and authenticity. Thomas extensively researched the storyline, basing the character of Susan on a real person and ensuring the prosthetics depicted were accurate. She spoke to adults who were affected by the drug and hadn't actually seen themselves as baby, sharing her work with them to ensure sensitivity in the portrayal. When, this, when these adults watched the episode, they commented that they were very moved and felt that the story had finally, the story had been validated. 
The storyline on Call the Midwife played an important role in filling a gap in Britain's collective memory, and perhaps it's a morsel more impactfully than a book or documentary could have. Call the Midwife actively contributes to the representation of marginalised voices in history, on, in history and on television. While it's written primarily by white middle class women, there is a collaboration with the communities depicted to ensure their stories are told with sensitivity and love. Importantly, these stories are grounded in reality and portrayed by actors who have lived experience with the stories. The writers, including Thomas, actively listen to ensure accuracy, but more importantly, authenticity. Call the Midwife is public history by stealth. On the surface, it appears to be the traditional and conservative British period drama, with nuns, nurses and the East End, rather than ball gowns, drawing room and debutantes. Dismissed as twee and nostalgic by both historians and viewers alike, it is judged to have no historical value because it appears to reflect the dominant narrative of British national identity. However, you dismiss Call the Midwife at your peril because hiding in plain sight is something rather revolutionary. The British period drama is no longer simply a cosy Sunday night comfort. It now brings opportunities to challenge how we view, think and talk about the past. The power of period drama as public history lies in its potential to reclaim marginalised histories by offering visual representations of these missing or ignored narratives. Representation matters. We cannot be a better society until we see it. By depicting marginalised histories through national identity, dramas like Call the Midwife are offering radical versions of Britishness, complicating the history and revealing national shames as well as triumphs. These dramas are a critical form of public history, and by dismissing them as undemanding and holding them to unattainable levels of accuracy, critics and historians are making light of the experience of those people who consume them. In the words of writer Dr. Emily Garside, it might just be TV, but it matters to a lot of people. From personal experience, finding something that speaks to you in whatever format can be extremely powerful. As historians, we shouldn't underestimate the power of period drama to inspire historical inquiry, act as a gateway, and offer opportunities to engender historical consciousness. Period dramas reach a much wider audience than academic history can, reaching those people who would never visit a museum or pick up a history book by making the past relevant to every day. We underestimate period drama at our peril. If you do want to take a photo, you are welcome to. <laughs> she would be very happy about that. Um, <laughs> um, so I get the absolute pleasure of the last person of the day, introducing Sarah Kitchen, who has also just finished her MA in public history here at the University of York. And she will be talking about Queering the Narrative, YouTube and the Communication of LGBT History. Yes, as Kirsty mentioned, I did not get the memo that we were supposed to talk about Sunday Night BBC <laughs> Television, so I will be talking about YouTube instead. Um, just a quick note uh, about terminology before I start. Um, I will be using the word queer throughout. Um, in the past, this obviously has been used as a slur against people in the LGBTQ plus community. Um, it has sort of gone through a bit of a reclamation and also is used by theorists and is used by people I talk about within this talk. So um, if you're sensitive to that, I'm very sorry. Um, oh no, I'm not going for that yet, sorry. Um, so uh, in 1932, Carl Becker proclaimed that every man is his own historian. With the advent of the internet, this has only become more true. Access to information has widened greatly and now non-academics can do work similar to that of the professional historian. This is clearly evident on YouTube. Uh, which has become a site where people within the queer community have begun to contribute to the creation of their own queer historical narrative. This work is particularly important for LGBTQ plus histories, as queer narratives have been consistently hidden from public view. Looking at the UK history curriculum, for example, LGBTQ plus topics are um, glaringly absent, Scotland being the only UK member nation that currently requires any LGBTQ plus content be taught in their history classes. This exclusion from educational institutions means that people, most people, will never learn about any queer history at all. Uh, this is compounded by the fact that queer um, people um, lack the traditional ways that uh, memory and history are passed down within marginalised groups. Um, 
people um, within the queer community um, may sometimes, in the past and in the present, be uncomfortable or unable to express their queer identities to their family and friends, which means that they won't be able to have their queerness included in family histories. Um, additionally, until fairly recently, queer people couldn't adopt, so um, they couldn't pass those histories down to children, and even if queer people now do have children, and queer people in the past have children, um, those children are not guaranteed to be members of the LGBTQ plus community, um, meaning that there's sometimes not really a guarantee that they will also continue telling these stories. Um, this lack of um, ab uh, presence in the past has led to what some theorists have described as an altered sense of temporality within the queer community. These same theorists, such as Elizabeth Freeman, have argued that this queer temporality can be somewhat fixed by putting more work into uncovering the queer histories of the past. In recent years, this has begun to happen in professional circles. This can be seen through archive intervention, uh, which is working on finding the presence of queer people within the historical record and creating records of queer people in the present for future historians. But the public don't go to archives generally, and this needs to be happening on a wider scale. Um, film critic Ben Walters theorises that films can readdress the lack of, quote, traditional channels for the transmission of unique heritage of the queer experience. He discusses the potential for queer documentaries to allow LGBTQ plus people to discover more qu hidden queer histories. I believe that YouTube videos can do a similar thing. Uh, queer creators are becoming their own historians, researching and creating their own works of history. In this talk, I want to highlight just a few creators and talk about how they are contributing to queer history making. First of all, I want to talk about Rowan Ellis, this lady on the side. Um, in this first video, entitled, as you can see, Indoctrination, a history of homophobia in schools, um, she talks about the history of homophobia in schools. Um, specifically, um, topics such as the American Save Our Children campaign and Section 28 within the UK. Um, she presents this in a kind of more traditional documentary style. Um, I didn't take a photo of her in the thing, but um, she is sort of presenting directly to camera with intercuts of archival images and footage. Here you can see Harvey Milk. Um, by doing this, she evokes more traditional tones of history making and history telling, which makes her narratives uh, easier to um, digest and seem more legitimate to um, an uninformed audience. However, throughout, she also interjects her own personal anecdotes, such as uh, talking about when she was in school and how um, the school internet filtering system would filter out any LGBTQ plus content regardless of what it was. She specifically cites that uh, the queer charity Stonewall was blocked within her school. Um, by talking about things on a more personal level and inter uh, <laughs> putting in her own anecdotes, um, she evokes a tone of family history. Obviously family history is generally conducted as the name suggests within a family. Um, but I think that the kind of important part of family history is the fact that there are individual stories being passed down between individuals. So by her sort of both showing a more traditional documentary style while interjecting her own anecdotes, um, she makes the transmission of queer history more personal and easy tr to transmit to um, a viewer. In another video entitled, Is LGBTQ plus history fake? Uh, Ellis talks to uh, this man you can see on the left. I mean, actually, that's your right. <laughs> <laughs> Apologies. Uh, this is Matthew Story. He was, at the time at least, I'm not sure if he still is, a curator at Historic Royal Palaces. This video is more casual um, than the last video I talked about and is entirely a conversation in the form of a relaxed interview. This video, however, simply, uh, rather than looking simply at a historical event and presenting it, 
is more of an analysis on methodology. Um, throughout the video, questions are posed about various topics about from uh, questioning what evidence we can use to uncover the lives of queer people in the past to discussing and theorising about what material culture from today may be used in the museums of the future. This demonstrates, I think quite handily, um, co-production of history. Although Ellis is playing the part of the interviewer, there is never the implication that she's uninformed. She offers her own interpretations on how difficult it can be to study queer history. For example, expressing frustrations at the idea that many historians have denied the historical, uh, historical person's queerness because there's simply not enough evidence. This video was released on Ellis's own YouTube channel, so it's hardly surprising that she's framed as equally important to story. But having the professional implies to the audience that the expert is not always somebody who is hidden away behind a desk writing somewhere. Um, Zinn uh, persuasively argues that the process of professionalization can act as a form of social control which works towards maintaining uh, traditional structures and therefore traditional values. In this video, Ellis and Story are discussing queer history, something that is already in itself disrupting the status quo. And this disruption is compounded by the de-emphasis of the professional. Moving on. Uh, this is Jessica felgren Fozard. She is a lesbian creator who makes videos uh, looking at topics such as uh, lesbian motherhood and living with a disability. She talks a lot about history on her channel, not just queer history, also disability history, but that's not what we're focusing on today. Uh, before seeing any queer historical content, having a channel based around her experiences as a queer parent helps to dispel some of the ideas around queer memory making. In the theory of queer temporality, queer people exist, out in a, exist in a kind of timeless state due to their absence from the past and their inability to transfer memory through family. However, even before watching any of her videos, Kelvin Frozard's status as a mother dismantles the idea that queer people cannot pass down their history. Kelvin Frozard has created um, a series of YouTube shorts uh, entitled uh, Queer History 101. The topics from these videos uh, range from uh, the origin of the rainbow flag to explaining the lavender marriage. The format of the, uh, of the YouTube short means that it's under one minute. Uh, this compact nature means that it's more accessible to a beginner. Uh, they're not going to be potentially overwhelmed by the level of um, detail that would be included in a longer video. Um, it also means that somebody who may not, who may not be sure if they want to invest a longer time learning about queer history can get a little snippet and maybe be drawn in to watch a bit more. Uh, throughout these videos, she uses visuals. You can see the example that is on your right. Um, there's sort of still images popping up on screen. These images are generally, throughout all of these shorts, overlaid onto her, not overtaking her. By using the images and not videos, she keeps the viewer grounded in the present and the attention mostly focused on her as the active element of the video, while still so while grounding the viewer in the present, still introducing the elements of the past. She also uses upbeat music to evoke a more upbeat music to evoke a more positive atmosphere in her videos. This tone could allow for the transmission of slightly darker facts without potentially alienating the viewer. This more positive tone uh, carries on into her video um, 10 LGBTQ plus people you should know about. Um, she uses a more upbeat tone of voice even when discussing difficult aspects of these people's stories, such as she discusses um, trans activist Marsha P. Johnson and the difficulties she went through in her life. Kelvin Frozard seems to make a conscious effort to highlight the uplifting parts of people's stories. Um, the choice to lean away from more tragic representations of queer history is refreshing. The choice to si uh, this choice sidesets criticisms leveled at other media representations of the queer past. Queer films have traditionally focused on tragic tales, often fatal ones, and are often drenched in melancholy. Um, by evoking this more positive tone, these videos could therefore be valuable to a queer person who is searching for some history that doesn't potentially reinforce the idea that the queer experience is inevitably a difficult one. 
In this video, Kelvin Frozard profiles 10 influential LGBTQ plus people, um, or couples, there are some couples in there, uh, and discusses their importance to history. Interestingly, she doesn't just talk about people in the past. Um, she includes people such as Jonathan Van Ness from Queer Eye and Alicia Garza, who is the one of the creators of the Black Lives Matter uh, group, alongside historical figures such as Marlene Dietrich. Um, by placing these contemporary queer figures alongside historical ones, Kelvin Frozard creates a connection between the then and the now. Carolyn Dinshaw discusses how through queer history we can touch across time and make contact between the queer people of the past and of today. Through these touches, she suggests, we can form communities across time. In this video, the chronology is completely collapsed. And for a time, all of these queer individuals exist at once. By placing all of these disparate people together, Kelvin Frozart create, uh, curates a community for an audience. Um, by promoting a sense of community, she also helps to re uh, reinforce both queer identity and queer memory. Much like television and film before it, YouTube has become a key site for the visual communication of queer narratives. The fact that anybody with an internet access it can load content without having to worry about things like budget or network approval, allows for a democratisation of history making. Anybody can truly be a historian. This freedom to create has presented a valuable opportunity for members of the queer community to create and share works that help square, uh, yeah, spread queer memory. By displaying these queer stories, Ellis, Kelvin Frozard and many other queer creators assert the fact that queer people are here and in fact have always been here. By presenting these histories on YouTube, they ensure that these narratives are easily accessible for a public audience and therefore allow these histories to be spread more widely than ever before. The field of history is in dire need of more diverse narratives. Professionals are doing their part, but it's not yet reaching widely enough. Freeman talks about the desire among queer academics for more eclectic, idiosyncratic and transient ways of communicating queer history. These videos made by queer creators could be part of this eclectic and idiosyncratic communication of the past. This transmission isn't perfect. These videos are still relatively niche and may not be seen by a particularly wide audience in the grand scheme of things, especially since YouTube has a history of suppressing LGBTQ plus content. These videos, though, can act as a sort of intervention, a call to action to make sure that queer people are engaged in the process of history making with the hope that in the future queer narratives will be a part of just history. YouTube videos cannot make up for the systematic exclusion of historical queer people from our education system, nor their exclusion from traditional tellings of history. But it is a start. <laughs>